Uh, I'm Inu Gello, I'm a nephrologist, professor of medicine with the University of Alberta, Canada. I'm a co-chair for the International Society of uh, Nephrology, Global Kidney Health uh, Atlas. I have uh, here with me today, Professor Adira Levin from UBC. Yeah, my name is Adira Levin and I'm um, a professor of medicine at UBC, uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, pleased to be here with you. And on my left is... I'm David Thompson, I'm a kidney specialist in Brisbane, Australia, and I co-chair the uh, ISM Global Kidney Health Atlas for the minute. Thank you very much, and uh, we're here to discuss about the ISM Global Kidney Health uh, Atlas which is an important initiative by the ISM to uh, document capacity for kidney care, structures and organization, as well as uh, services for optimal uh, kidney care delivery in all countries of the world and regions. This is a very important uh, exercise that started around uh, 2015 and it has already seen through three successful uh, iterations. It's uh, one of the largest uh, survey of eight kinds uh, conducted by any uh, professional uh, organization in the world. Uh, we're here today to uh, discuss about the merit of the project, the key objectives and the uh, success uh, metrics and why it has been done to support countries and policy makers uh, with data to help with the improv improvement in kidney care services uh, across the world. Uh, first of all, I will start with uh, Professor Dr. Levin uh, because ISMGKG, our colleagues, uh, is your grandchild. So, what is the whole idea uh, uh, behind it? Why did you develop it? Well, I mean, I think it's a it's a we, um, and I think the notion behind the Global Kidney Health Atlas is that you can't change policy or care or improve things if you don't have data, and all of us, I think, agree to that. And Sources of data are very variable and there are lots of different ways to collect it, but we thought that as a global community, if we together could collect information that was relevant to clinicians, patients, and researchers and policymakers in some kind of unified way, that would really help the global community to a, feel like a global community, but also work with each other. And so as an advocacy tool, a research tool, a clinical care optimal, um, services tool, we thought that this would be a, a good initiative. I think that it's, uh, it's grown wild, beyond all of our wildest dreams, I think. Uh, it's been, it's a truly a, a fantastic resource and the fact that you can do it consecutively over time and see both changes as well as like regression and progression, which actually tells us about the state of the world and where there are wars or disasters of other sorts, things fall apart and where things develop then things improve and I think that that's a really good lesson for the community and I think the vision is that it will help us understand ourselves better and then figure out how to help each other improve. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a, a, a very important point. Uh, so the whole goal of it is targeted to really policy making towards improvement in kidney care around the world countries uh, region to identify those gaps. Um, 100%. So I think no, no, administrator, yeah, no administrator and no policy maker is going to change stuff just because a bunch of people say we need better care. I think that when you can show data and you can show data with your companion country or your, someone else in your region that's doing it better, I think most people will respond to that. And I think the WHO as well as regional groups are becoming more and more responsive to hard data, and that's what I think is there. And it's complementary to other initiatives, um, which I think is also important. It's not a standalone, but I think it's the most comprehensive and comparative piece of work that's been done, as you already said. Thank you very much, and I'll move on to, to uh, David. This is quite an impressive amount of work, one of the largest of its kind, involving almost all countries around the world. Yes. How did you get to, to, to design it around it so successfully? It's, it's not a small measure of uh, success to have involved, engaged over 160 countries of the world, comprising nearly 99% of the global population. Well, it is a large amount of work. You designed it with me, but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, we've, um, it's huge. When we, the, with the first iteration, we had 
in 25 countries, the second in 2019, we had 160. Now we've done 167 countries, and we had contacts with around 190 countries out of the 218 countries that are recognised by the United Nations. So it is an exceedingly large body of work. I mean, the critical success factors are we all had to, you know, we all had the same objective. Mm -hmm. Um, the, we needed the team, you know, we made sure we assembled team members who had the, the expertise to do this. And probably the most important thing is communication. We needed to be able to identify contacts with each of the countries, the society leaderships, the uh, consumer organisation representatives, policy makers, to identify the key people with whom we had to, uh, had to make contact to be able to obtain the information that we required for the Atlas. And, uh, and, you, can, and you can remember well when we um, when we set off this atlas, so we just sent thousands and thousands of emails and binders to try to obtain the information that we required. So, uh, and then we had to, there was lots of liaising with the IC regional boards to be able to ensure that this was coordinated. We had to, then we had to do a lot of clean up work with um, resolving discrepancies, again involving lots of communication. And then, and I guess the most important aspect in this work is in the knowledge dissemination, making sure that we get uh, this out there using things like uh, this to. Uh, and really, I guess the most important body of work is to try to make sure it gets implemented, that, uh, that the, the lessons learned from the Atlas uh, actually get implemented at the country level so we can achieve global change at a local level. Yeah, and in the design area, we did leverage the, the, the World Health Organization um, Universal Health Access uh, metrics, yes. all the six key elements. So, yes. So, what are the key messages from the Atlas around this universal health care access domain? So, key messages are there are substantial um, substantial disparities. You know, when you look across the world, both between countries and also within countries, in um, you know how how different countries go according to those six WHO building blocks of healthcare. There are enormous disparities in workforce. So nephrologists, uh, uh, forty-fold difference in, you know, about, uh, in uh, you know, the number of nephrologists, prevalence of nephrologists between low-income countries when you got to high-income countries. Um, yeah, even if you take the worst country and the best country, there's about a thousand-fold difference in the size of nephrologists' workforce. So, uh, and, and eighty-seven percent of countries use nephrologists as their primary workforce, but there's one in six countries. Uh, it's not the nephrologists who are the key drivers of looking after patients with kidney care. Right. And there are significant shortages in almost all aspects of uh, workforce that are more marked in the low income countries. Access to kidney replacement therapy and conservative kidney management, again, is, uh, is highly variable. And with a typical gradient, it's, it's not too bad in high income countries, it gets progressively worse as we move to low income countries. Considerable out of pocket expenses uh, for um, in terms of access to, to, to medicines. Health information systems, uh, um, only about two thirds of the countries have kidney replacement therapy registries, 19% have kidney, kidney you know, non dialysis kidney disease registries, and about 9% have conservative kidney management registries. So there's uh, a basic in, for managing, you know, as just as the Atlas is using trying to measure a problem so it can be managed. Within each country, we need registries and health information systems to be able to um, you know, make a difference or to at least understand what the problem is so you can identify solutions. And most countries don't have that, particularly you know, low income countries. And a lack of leadership in governments in, uh, in many countries. Uh, most do not recognise kidney disease as the priority that it is and should be. And um, most don't have significant policies for uh, kidney disease, particularly in low income countries. Um, and uh, um, so I guess they're probably the, the key things, and I guess in this iteration uh, of the Atlas, we also had a patient perspective, which uh, so we had, so we had a better understanding of you know, from patients' point of view, the things they're most concerned about is how they live their life, their ability to work, their ability to move around, uh, and a bit of the ability to participate in life, and they identified key barriers being access access to um, you know, kidney failure treatment, access to uh, you know, medications. Um, and having policies in place to patients with kidney disease. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, so, Adrian, how do you see various countries of the world leveraging all this uh, very colossal amount of data generated and improving their kidney care services? Well, I think 
firstly, the work that um, your teams have done in terms of preparing slide sets for each different country and region is hugely helpful. So I think it's one thing to create an atlas. It's another thing to create some tools to look at, but then to create presentations and then to teach people how to use them in their own local environment to advance or identify gaps, I think, is huge. I think one thing that is also important that is always a learning and sobers me every time I, I look at the atlas is lack of access to a blood pressure cuff, a test for urine or a test for creatinine will limit de facto your ability to identify kidney disease and I think that's quite you know sobering and makes us all pause like you can't even identify the condition let alone take care of it. But I think in the context of um, how each region can use it is and I would this is a bit of a plea is for the ISN regional boards and the members to look at those slide sets, to understand the data, to understand what it means for them and what they can do in their own local environment. And advocacy with data is always more powerful than you know than advocacy without data. I mean, yes, you can you know show people dying, but it's very different to show hard numbers that are consistent over time. Uh, or comparing them to other groups. So I think that, that that's really valuable and people should learn how to do it. I think one of the things that we got out of yesterday's Global uh, Policy Forum might be that we need to um, help identify within each region who of the nephrology community should talk to who in the non-nephrology community in, a, in an organized way and teach people how to advocate and how to use the data in the most meaningful way possible. Yeah, so that's also a great point. Um, I, I remember over the last three, two or three uh, World Congress of uh, Nephrology, the Global uh, Policy Forum has become a, a current team. And every, each of the session, the Atlas team, we have been invited to make presentation of the nature. Why, why is that so? What do you have to hope to achieve with that? Well, I think an awareness of each region, because I think whilst you all keep, well, in the process of collecting the data, you communicate with the regional board chairs and members. I think when people from the region come in and see the data, which they might not see or hear just from the flat presentation or from the regional board, I think it makes it come alive. And when something comes alive, then they actually think about how they might use it. And so the point of having a policy form in each different region is that ideally the ministers of health and others come, but even the nephrologists become aware. And that awareness, I think, breeds curiosity, and that curiosity will breed solutions, and I think that's how we become part of a global solution as opposed to just identifying the problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going into some specific findings across the spectrum of uh, kidney care. One of the problems we found in the, in the Atlas is, is uh, limitation with risk identification for chronic kidney disease. For example, albuminuria detection. Less than 10% of low-income countries will have capacity to do an alpospis in patients with diabetes to detect albuminuria and initiate evidence-based uh, treatment. This is also an important problem even in, in, in upper middle income, high income countries, particularly in, in primary care. There's still significant gaps there, uh, which create a problem because with this evidence-based new medication coming up, LGL2 inhibitors now, uh, uh, GLP-1 agonist coming on board, mineral, mineral, uh, MRP agonist, as well as RAS inhibition. So we have uh, the opportunity to now apply this intervention for the benefit of our patients. But for that to be done, we have to be able to identify those risks that will need such kind of uh, treatment. So what is the way forward regarding this, even for the high income nations of the world, where there's significant gap, significant limitation with risk identification for CK? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing that um, you know, it seems so simple. I mean, the two basic things you need to, uh, you know, to detect kidney disease, a simple kidney health check with testing the urine for albumin and uh, testing, a blood test for crappy PGF1. And yet most you know, countries, a lot of countries are not able to do even that, um, mm -hmm. those things. And even when, they, even when they are able to do those tests, they often don't do it um, yeah. you know, in people who are at risk. So the Atlas also shows about 50%, you know, about half, have a, a just a reactive strategy. They're relying on ad hoc detection of patients with kidney disease. 
Yeah. And of the other half that uh, do have some process for systematically identifying patients, the majority, about 42%, are, um, are in the context of routine health counselors trying to just rely on primary health care physicians to identify someone who's at risk of kidney disease and then doing taking that next step to do the test. So uh, it's, uh, I think you know we need to start. Uh, I think we have the crisis at hand on the one hand, treating the pointy end of kidney disease, which is kidney failure, which is the very expensive end. And there needs to be a shift more towards um, prevention. Mm -hmm. Just recently in Australia and New Zealand, we did a, a costing exercise. You get a return on investment of $45 for every dollar invested in kidney disease detection. So to give just put that in context for mental health, uh, the ROI is $12. So you actually get a bigger bang for your buck investing in kidney disease detection and prevention with appropriate treatments like SGLT2 inhibitors. And there needs to be much more emphasis on that. And I think for low income countries in particular, where they are resource limited, um, they are much better off investing in prevention and detection and prevention than they are in treatment of kidney failure. Yeah, just maybe yeah. to add to that, one of the things I think is that people are aware of the risk of kidney disease and you get patients to say, could you test my urine and could you test my kidney function, as opposed to relying on physicians or the healthcare system to do it, that would also be helpful. And I think that patient awareness as well as physician awareness, A, of the simplicity and B, of the value. And I think it's also probably important to say that for a lot of people, they don't know that there are not cures, but there are significant improvements in the kidney landscape that is not necessarily well known by primary care physicians, not necessarily well known by specialists, and so perhaps helping you with understand you're not just finding it to give people bad news, you're finding it because you can do something about it. And 20 years ago, I don't think we would have sat here and said it was really important. It would have been really important to identify, but we wouldn't have necessarily said, and there's lots we can do about it. And now I think we're really lucky that we can say that there's something we can do about it. As our indigenous uh, patients, uh, and you were there, uh, I mean, but they said to us, please stop telling us about kidney disease and tell us about kidney health. And so I think identifying healthy kidneys and not so healthy kidneys is really important, and I think that's a different paradigm, and people are pretty excited to understand that a little a different way. Yeah, and that's partly what we do, similar to Australian patients also in Canada, under the Council Initiative also being led by you, Adra. Well, a component of that is the kidney health check program, which is essentially targeted to high risk population, essentially indigenous communities uh, across Canada. We go into those communities to do early detection, identify the factors, and treat, and link them to care as uh, appropriate. Screen and link to care, and that's the difference. It's screening, triage, and treatment, and they get rapid access and it, it's really and the communities want it because they see how devastated they are by the identification of late kidney disease so they it's really been a very successful yeah, and, and uh, another aspect to, to, to this is the distribution of uh, facilities for the provision of kidney replacement in terms of dialysis uh, in terms of uh, competition. Uh, we do see a high uptake for hemodialysis. Almost all world countries will see, yes, we do have hemodialysis uh, 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 available. But the key issue is uh, affordability access because of uh, limitation in public funding. Another uh, important problem we recognize is uh, low uptake of home dialysis, in particular, electronic dialysis in general, particularly in low income settings. What, what do you have to say, David, about this? Because you have a very important role there. Yeah. We yeah, are to have as also a leader with the uh, International Society of Pretrona Dialysis. Yeah. So, so what is militating against the optic of uh, home dialysis? It's, it's, it's complex. It's and there, are, there, are, there are different barriers in different countries. But uh, you're right, like uh, nearly 100% of countries involved in the Global Kidney Health Atlas so have hemodialysis available. Yeah. It's only about 80% for peritoneal dialysis, and it's in 70% for kidney transplantation. And, um, and really, you know, if you actually took a patient-centered perspective, uh, home dialysis would be, that's what they want, you know. Patients yeah. want to be able to dialyze home, dialyze on country if they're indigenous First Nations. Um, they don't want to be dislocated to have to then travel to a hemodialysis unit or even relocate to a different city so they can actually undertake dialysis. It's, if you were designing a healthcare system to look after kidney failure, you wouldn't, 
we wouldn't go with a uh, facility given else. And so you try to identify, you try to um, come up with home-based dialysis. So why don't we use it uh, more often? There's a whole pile of different factors. There are you know, physician factors, there are biases uh, you know, that, that lead to the favouring of hemodialysis, either because that's what they're used to and it's habit, or because there are conflicts of interest in place where it's, um, it's financially incentivised for physicians to provide hemodialysis rather than home-based dialysis like peripheral dialysis. There are, um, there are economic factors. I mean, most countries around the world, peripheral dialysis is cheaper than hemodialysis. In some countries where it's more expensive, where, where it is more expensive to do peritoneal dialysis because they lack things like local fluid manufacture, so that makes the shipping of fluids more expensive. So we need to remove those sorts of barriers to dialysis, so address the physician bias, address the patient's fear of um, you know, home-based dialysis, and uh, address the cost implications, reduce tariffs on, on PD fluids, encourage local manufacturing, come up with innovative designs like the Fluid Dialysis Project, which is basically allows peritoneal dialysis to be done very cheaply and efficiently uh, the uh, home. So um, we need to remove the barriers that currently are in place. And, and, and uh, importantly related to that as well, about sustainability. I don't know, you always talk about the sustainability in kidney care program, pro from prevention, the retarding progression, to kidney failure and treatment for kidney failure itself. Looking into the enormous cost for provision of dialysis would consume 20 percent of healthcare budget in all the countries that we practice, Canada, Australia, UK, obviously. And, and I was talking, just to put into context to, to a colleague nephrologist from, uh, from Africa yesterday, uh, he, he told me that if a nephrologist were required dialysis in many parts of Africa, in fact, that person will not be able to afford to subsume dialysis for one month. Because a cost for one dialysis session is almost equivalent to monthly, you know, minimum wage. So, I mean, making the case that this is just not sustainable, not sustainable. in think, the long run, even in higher prices. Yeah, and I, I think that part of it is, and then, like, perhaps to be a bit radical, the understanding that dying from lack of availability of dialysis is not acceptable. It came up yesterday at the forum, it's a human right to be able to have treatment for a treatable disease. And if that's the case, then we need to work collectively to truly reduce costs, whether it's local production or just make it affordable. Um, without being pejorative, companies are making a lot of money in rich countries that can sort of afford it. So how about they invest, like they did with HIV and antiretrovirals, they give it for cheaper to the other countries that can't afford it, because that's the way that you change things. And it makes it a moral obligation that if you're making X amount of dollars, then why never have to be invested into places that can't afford it? Um, you know, uh, the, what's it called, the, um, the overwhelming financial burden that kidney care even before dialysis costs people. And I think that's the other thing is to go back to early early detection and prevention. There's a toll as you progress before you even get to dialysis with more and more doctor's appointments, more and more decision making, less and less feeling well, more absenteeism, um, all that kind of thing. How do you actually make people understand that that's all part of sustainability? And maybe a plug for green nephrology is the fact that all of these things, so 4.6% of um, global emissions are from healthcare, a disproportionate amount of that is from dialysis, and a disproportionate amount of that is from hemodialysis. So why are we promoting the least green, or, or why is anyone saying that the least green thing that we can possibly treat people with is the one that is the most used around the world? And advocating for you know delaying progression will mean that you won't need dialysis, so that's great. But then at least we should find ways to do it closer to home. Not transportation and consumables are the two things that drive the cost of dialysis. So transportation to and from three times a week is way more than staying home. So there's lots of ways that we can help governments and other people to understand why we need to change the way that we think about all of this. Thank you very much. So making the point that for effective care delivery, um, and not only in communities, of course, we, we require highly functional um, uh, material uh, resources, as well as also human resources. 
So that comes to another angle to that level where we found significant deficiencies with the distribution of workforce needed for KB care. Uh, for example, today in, in the world, we have about 10 apologies, five million of the global uh, population. But in some certain countries, particularly low income nation, that proportion is less than one per million population. There are some certain countries we identified where there is one apologies for 10 million uh, people. So, what do we do with this? Because obviously, we can buy resources, dialysis solution, buy kidney machine build hospitals, kidney care clinic, dialysis unit, but we cannot provide a couple of months manufacture kidney specialists needed for highly effective uh, patient, uh, care for patient kidney care. So, yeah. so again, we have to be innovating too. Yeah. So, um, the, the, you know, there there is a dearth of specialists in, in those areas. And, you have to rely on um, task substitution and have other healthcare professionals you know, uh, do those roles and help with multidisciplinary teams so you get uh, wiser decision making and, um, you know, and, and invest in things like telenephology, you know, particularly during COVID. You know, during COVID times, we're all well versed in that now, we should be making much more use of it than, than we have been. So, working you know, smarter to overcome the, the workforce shortages that exist in the kidney workforce. And maybe even just to add with in Thailand, what they've also done is said there's village workers. Now they're not even they're they're trained to do things like take blood pressures and weigh people and do a finger stick and dip a year and it doesn't always have to be medical. Like we're very medically oriented and communities want to stay healthy and well. So what if we were very innovative and said, you know, maybe we'll never solve the dearth of nephrology problem, but we could educate communities to understand how better to do things have an elder or have someone who's interested, you could also then have a sustainability of employing people within community to be that village care worker or village care specialist mm -hmm. um, with limited medical training and access to specialists. Like you need access more than you need the specialist. And so maybe thinking about how to create a really an international network or a regional network of access to care, yeah. not just say we need more nephrologists because as you said, you're not going to create those overnight. Mm -hmm and they're susceptible to. <laughs> so essentially we need them just probably as champions, yeah. as leaders to lead advocacy, and we need a sort of a workforce task shifting, yeah. training all these uh, commun Teams. community volunteer health workers. Because even in higher information, we don't have capacity to yeah. see all people living with kidney disease. Estimated to be 10% of the global population. We can just do that. Um, we did require the help of primary care. Yeah. So this is more pertinent in low income settings where they don't even have enough of uh, general physician and doctors and nurses to care. Yeah. Is, is 10 or 11% of, uh, of the community, you need a high capacity healthcare system to deal with that. You're never going to have, even in high income countries, enough specialists to deal with everyone with kidney disease. So we need to have, uh, have models to allow for those things, and particularly in First Nations you know, communities, having local you know, having local members of the community you know, uh, trained up to help uh, detect kidney disease, or, you know, do kidney health checks. That that um, that seems to engage the communities better than actually having specialists there anyway. Yeah. And I do also. You have done a lot of the engagement. I know even during your tenure as uh, ISN president with international stakeholder organization, uh, WHO, UN, World Bank. So how do you see the ISN? working with them with this information so that it could be leveraged to inform decision making in individual countries of the world. I think, I guess if we've learned anything over time, it's yeah. that there are things that you can influence and engage in conversations with large organizations, but when it comes to the heavy lifting, the hard work has to be done locally. But the more, um, it was interesting to hear um, the WHO address to the public forum yesterday that all of a sudden they understand the connection between life cycle, uh, social and environmental health, and kidney health. It was really amazing. So if WHO starts to understand it, the UN understands it, and then we have a presence when we have disasters and people understand about not getting your medicine, not getting dialysis, is life saving care, that perhaps you, you change and you create a narrative that is very accessible. I think most people in the world can talk about diabetes and obesity. They should actually be able to talk about kidney disease the same way, and everyone should be as well versed in it. 
and I think that that's, and I think, without trying to sound too high in the sky, if you help fix kidney disease, most people will see a return on investment way sooner if you address kidney disease your problem. Obesity and diabetes will take a decade to move the needle. If you address kidney disease, you will affect a lot of people quite quickly, like in two or three years, you can change people's course. And that I think we've undersold. And I think if WHO and, and World Bank could understand like that investment will give a, a return much shorter time period. Not that you shouldn't invest in obesity and diet and poverty and uh, not saying you should, but you'll see a return much quicker if you sort of focus on a super high risk population. That's like changing the narrative and making sure that you we're consistent in our framework I think it's also quite important. Yeah. And one of the things that we have done also with this atlas is the development of this scorecard so that we can monitor changes, we can know, monitor progress of uh, the countries in the provision of kidney care, care services. And we have seen changes. For example, with the onset of uh, COVID, the, what are the, any trend with the uptake of uh, dialysis transplantation? The current iteration and previous ones? There have been, I mean, there were some changes. Yeah. Mostly overall, the changes are positive. There are, have been increases in, you know, both hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, kidney transplantation. So things have overall improved. Um, disappointing, we haven't seen enough, though. It was hoped that maybe there would be more peritoneal dialysis use uh, with COVID um, yeah. because, you know, people would be at home, they could more easily isolate, better hand hygiene might have reduced. But, um, Hasn't, the increase in peritoneal analysis wasn't as much as uh, it was for human analysis. Right. So there have been um, there have been improvements. And overall, things the, you know things have been have got better. Having said that, there were quite a number of countries that improved, and quite a number of countries that uh, you know, went backwards. And uh, in general terms, the higher income countries experienced more improvements, and there were less improvements in the lower income countries, and some some went backwards. So I guess if anything, with the changes, the, the, the divide between low income countries and high income countries seems to have got slightly worse. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, so, Adria, how do you see this going forward now? In the next, for example, in the next uh, um, decade to come. How do you see the IS and GKH as a tool for changing the current paradigm of kidney care in general? In general, I mean, I think it, in general, I think what I think the most valuable, you know, is the sense of collaboration and togetherness that it brings. That we can see each other together in a document that describes us, you know, and it's not a them. And so as a global community, I think it's a very powerful tool um, that keeps us together and to David's point, like showing progression and regression. Um, ideally, I'd like to see that there are more registries, that people see the value of registries and so that over the next decade, I'd like to see that there are more CKD and where they don't have dialysis and transplant registries, that those come into play because they inform outcomes and patients. Um, and I think that as a community, we can be proud that we, A, can collect the data together, B, we sometimes can act on it in different places and share the success stories of people that acted on, on the gaps and showed that, that change. Um, but that we see how we can help each other um, to change. And I think it will be a, a fantastic uh, legacy to watch over the years how we've changed for the better, and I think, um, and the regions, I think it bonds the regions in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've seen yeah. before, like I've noticed it in, the, in even the seven years, like it's quite impressive that the regions actually feel like, oh, I want to see what our data is, and I want to compare, and that's actually quite good, so. Exactly, that's a very important point, and, and they seem to own the data. And with every iteration, we also try to engage them to also go deep dive into ground that data in their own region and publish it themselves yeah. when they're their own leadership. And, and one thing I like about the exercise also is the level of engagement, community uh, building and trust and uh, working with nephrologists, policy makers, patient groups in over 160 countries of the world working together, contribute data, get it analyzed, use that data to inform kidney care, design, delivery, I think is yeah, I think the fact, the fact that we've increased the number of countries each time 
that wouldn't happen unless people thought there was value. Because that is a big, having filled it out myself, and there's a big survey to fill out. It's quite a commitment to uh, complete that survey, and you'd only do it if you felt that you were getting. Yeah, yeah. And one also that we didn't, uh, we do, uh, an uh, important point about it is the capacity building for the future. Yeah. We are not only engaging current you know, colleges, but we're also trained young adults. I think, yes, I think that can't be under, that cannot be under, 100%, that can't yeah. be under, under, it needs to be sold very much as the next generation sees the value of data, the value of collecting it, and they can be the next leaders. And I think that that's, the other, you know, the other really important legacy that the Atlas has. Yeah. Remember when we first started, we had what half a dozen fellows. We're now at 25. And at this, uh, even at yeah. this conference, I've been approached by so many young ufologists <laughs> mm -hmm. wanting to be but involved in the Atlas. Exactly. But we that's exactly what you want to. Well, and, and now it's present interest that's how they want to be part of this. So. And they learn about epidemiology, exactly. they learn about cleaning exactly. data. Like they learn a number of skills that are good in the clinical practice and they're very good in advocacy and policy making. And I think it's a it's been a really interesting catalyst to create um, you know a worldwide collaborative that uh, that isn't easy to do exactly. across this many regions. So and yeah. they move on. We had Marina Weinstein, who was one of our early ICGK fellows. Now she's on WHO Youth Council. Youth Council, yeah. But, so. yeah. And many of these uh, young leaders are uh, uh, lead authors in various uh, component papers yeah. That's right. from human, uh, um, health information system, protonal dialysis, hemodialysis, right. kin are all led by young pathologists. Also. So helping them in their professional career development as well as skill with advocacy and data generation to inform policy and from clinical practice. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, that's a very positive note to end on. Yeah. It's all about the next generation, and that's, I think, the best investment we've made.